Hello, and welcome to the Pilot Base Podcast. I'm Ben, and I've been a pilot for over a decade. And I'm Dave, categorically not a pilot. Every Monday, we'll be chatting to both pilots and non-pilots with amazing aviation stories from all around the world. You can find all episodes of the Pilot Base Podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe to our channel and leave us a review. In episode two, we meet Susie McKee. From cabin crew to cockpit, Susie is a newly qualified commercial pilot entering the industry in a post-COVID world. Now pilots, are you a Boeing or an Airbus kind of person? Non-pilots, pick a side. I am firmly on the fence. Ben's on one side, Susie's on the other, and here she is to tell us why. Susie, hello. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Where are you? Good, thank you. I'm in Portsmouth, South England at the moment. So a bit of a grey day, but England for you. <laughs> oh, you want to get yourself up to North London. The sun is cracking the flags here. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> That's not true. It's absolutely freezing. Ben, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Dave. How are you, your side? Yeah, really good. Look, really looking forward to this uh, to this conversation, actually. Um, so down in Portsmouth at the moment, Susie, how much flying are you doing? Absolutely zero. Oh, no. <laughs> Just like the rest of the aviation world, then. I mean, I graduated school only three weeks ago now, so haven't had quite an opportunity to job hunt properly just yet. How did you celebrate graduating? I came back into lockdown, actually. So it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we had some champagne around the, the fire of the family, but it's as good as it gets at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you, that actually sounds amazing. It was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my closest thing to that is having a cup of coffee with the central heating on. So you'll definitely <laughs> live in the high life down there in Portsmouth. Um, so where shall, where shall we start with it? I tell you what, let's start right at the very beginning. We've got so much to talk about today. How much did aviation or being a pilot or just being in the sky in general feature for you as a youngster? Like, What are your first memories of falling in love with it, if you like? I think I was quite young when I started traveling. My family's half American. So we've always been to and from the States. And I think it got to a point when I was about seven or eight where I used to be way more excited to even get on the plane than to get to the States. So that's probably my earliest memory of aviation. I think my mum said I've been on a plane since I was nine weeks old. Wow. So I've had a bit to do with planes, but I don't come from a particularly like aviation orientated family. So it was something I sort of discovered on my own, really. Oh, that, is, that is one thing with pilots. There's a lot of aviation families so oh, yeah. the vast majority of the pilots I know they've at least got an uncle or somebody in aviation to kind of mm -hmm. show them the path. So you you yeah. haven't uh, you're not from an aviation family are you Ben? No no no. Oh this is great I've got two of you on one call fantastic. <laughs> so uh, at what point did you think well I can make a, a career out of this? Uh, I think it was sort of during my A-level time um, you know you do the generic like where do you want to be when you're 25 <laughs> quiz yeah. and my thing back as a leisure center owner <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's not for me <laughs> so yeah I was very confused started looking at other options um, and then I was torn between midwifery and aviation which again has nothing to do with each other um, so I kept my options very open sort of through school through uni and it was after uni where I was like I can pursue this now <laughs> To be fair, leisure centre owner, like, is that an independent? I was just thought it was the council. Yeah, well, you know, I could set up my own one, Susie's <laughs> leisure, you know. <laughs> hey, it's a, it's a long career. Anything's possible. So you you went you went to uni then. What did you study? Spanish and Italian. Again, nothing but to do with aviation. So. Incredibly handy, though. Goodness but that will me. come in very useful. I hope um, so. When you when you do your addresses to us, um, us lot in cattle class in the back, do you ever do them in Spanish and Italian? I actually did do one on a, I hadn't met a Madrid there and back on a triple seven when I was working as cabin crew. And they asked me to do the PA and I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> All these Spanish are looking at me. What, what's she saying? <laughs> uh, do you, do, 
because I'm I'm one of the I'm one of the worst flyers, and I'm sure I get hauled over the coals for this. But when the addresses are happening from cabin crew and the safety announcements at the beginning, I've usually got my my headphones snuck in and my hood up, so I can't get told off, and I I don't pay a lot of attention. I'm so sorry. But do you still? Well, you don't obviously now because you're a pilot. But do cabin crew still use the telephone? Oh yeah. <laughs> Pilots do as well, Dave. Really? No, stop it. Yeah, so I had an incident once. So you can do it over the headset, but you've got to, right. you, you can have a bit of finger trouble because you've got to like hold certain buttons down. And once I gave a whole <laughs> cabin announcement to Baghdad Control. That's my worst nightmare. Yeah. Absolute disaster. <laughs> oh no. Uh, how, how long until they butted in and said, well, you, Captain, I think they can't got butt the wrong... in on VHF because it's like a one way directional thing. So oh. I finished this like three minute thing and it was, it was like my fifth flight or something. So I'd written it all down. I was reading it verbatim and then I like released the thing and uh, <laughs> Baghdad Control were just like, uh, thanks for that, switch to tower. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Oh, just spend the rest of the flight sweating with embarrassment. Yeah, exactly. So the safest thing to do in the cockpit is we we have a little phone as well. So just pick that up, PA on the phone. Mm-hmm. Oh, amazing. I love that. The, literally the height of technology that can transport hundreds of people safely from one country to the next, 10 miles in the sky, and you've got a hardwired landline. <laughs> so you can... <laughs> Oh, amazing stuff. Right. So anyway, I want to sort of rush through this bit so we can get into the nitty gritty. Through university, you finish, you get your languages degree. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, Was Cabin Crew your your first job out of uni then? Yeah. Uh, Well, actually, I found myself working in an MOT garage for six months, which (laughs) I've had a rocky path. Okay. (laughs) I bet the Italian and Spanish was useful for that as well. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, there's lots of Spanish in uh, in the Portsmouth area. So. <laughs> no, it was a it was a good gap between finishing like academically and then like starting my job as cabin crew. To be honest, it it was just stay at home for a bit, recuperate from the exam stress at university, get myself together, and then move up to London. And was it always cabin crew that you wanted to do, or did you think straight away, I want to be a pilot, or I can be a pilot? It was my step into pilot school for me. I, like I said, where I don't have the sort of aviation influence within my family, I needed to force my way in. (laughs) So I used my time as cabin crew as like my stepping stone to get me in a position where I had something to sort of present in an interview with potential sponsors in pilot school. Is that a traditionally shortened path then? I think it's actually quite like a done thing now. A lot of okay. crew I know socially, have, uh, girls especially, have become uh, pilots or going into pilot school like, over the last year. Um, I do think it's like an easy way to get in if you, if you don't have that exposure to begin with. And also you sort of fall in love with it. A yeah. lot of cabin crew will start and they think, oh, I'm having a lovely time, but there's something the other side of that door. And that's where that, that, it's sort of the interest grows from. I'm asking this question earlier than I thought I was going to, but I think you're both going to have different answers to this. I'll start with you, Susie. Should all pilots, as part of their basic training, have to do a period as cabin crew? Yes. Ben? Um, I wouldn't fit in the cabin. I'm six foot five. Your your silence (laughs) is deafening on this, Ben. Well, I know what you think then. <laughs> um, actually, Dave, no, I do. I will say yes. Okay. And the reason for that is just to get a better appreciation of um, what's going on in the back. Because as pilots, you're, you fly the plane and, and all sorts of stuff like that, but also you manage the cabin. And a mm-hmm. lot of people have absolutely no idea realistically what's going on in the cabin. I mean, you send the first officer back to make a coffee and he's back in the cabin for about half an hour podging buttons, wasting (laughs) everything in the galley until the poor cabin crew comes over and cleans everything up after (laughs) gets him an actual coffee. No, I just, so I know that some, um, some companies, when they put, when they hire graduates, they make them do every job pretty much in the, uh, 
in the company before they give them the whatever management role they're qualifying for. I just think to give you a to give you a rounded view of what actually goes on on the flight, I think doing a, a little period in cabin crew would do you good. No, I agree. I think that's I agree. true. Uh, yeah. I thought, do you know, do you know what, Ben? I don't know whether it's the pressure of having a former member of cabin crew who's now a pilot on the call. I, I, on, I thought you were going to say no. I thought you were going to flat out refuse. Well, that. I think I'd be a terrible at it and b not enjoy it. Um, but I think it probably would be beneficial. Did you always enjoy it, Susie? It was definitely a job of high and low. <laughs> <laughs> what think... were the good bits then? Well, it's sold as a very glamorous job. If you look online, you go back in like all through history and it was a very sort of high end, elegant role. Um, but no one tells you that you're going to be sat in your jump seat at 4 a.m. with a cup of tea, hating every second yeah. being one of the smelliest plane in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the best things were literally I could go for breakfast in one country, lunch in another and dinner in another in a couple of days which was it, it, that side of it is glamorous mm. but it is the early mornings the clearing up the mess of the cabin people poking you shouting at you like you can't get paid enough for that no and, and the the latest the latest one is um i was on a short haul flight to italy a couple of months ago and one there was one member of cabin crew with a piece of paper and a pen because you can't queue for the for the loo now so they were making a list of people's names and seat numbers and forming the queue for the toilet and then going and letting oh, people God. know when it was their turn to go that's that's, that's probably not in the job description <laughs> is it? no no not at all um so you, you became cabin crew with a wish or a dream or, or or a vision that you were going to be doing that for a finite amount of time and then you were going to become a pilot. I gave myself a year originally. Okay. Um, and then I sort of didn't quite realize how long the process takes to get the right flight school, to get the right program for you. So I used another year. So I was there two years in the end, but every minute was perfect exposure to help me get to where I wanted to be. So. So how long were you cabin crew before you actually embarked on the, the pilot training or actually did were you doing any flying while you were still cabin crew i've never flown before i went to flight school no which way risky wow. <laughs> i was exactly yeah. the same yeah. really okay i don't feel so bad i just went for mm. it yeah i mean a lot of people especially when we started getting into the smaller aircraft sort of single engine training we were warned about the potential of not enjoying it because if you haven't had the chance to experience flight in a small aircraft you just might hate it and i thought i've come this far now i can't hate it surely and i know but you and i have talked about this ben you almost the money becomes a byproduct. You know, it's going to cost a lot of money to train to be a pilot, and it's it's a dream job for so many people. But just to get that far, I'd imagine you've put a fair amount of money down already. Imagine you've paid all that money. It's been your dream for however long. Then the first time you take off, you're like, nah, not for me, <laughs> lads. Don't fancy it. It happens. <laughs> I've heard it of it happening. Yeah, I know sure. some. I know some people that started their flying training. They got airsick. They didn't really like. Um, oh. the sort of pressures involved in it um, and they just gave up after sort of five hours of flying. <sighs> Did you love it straight away Susie? Yeah definitely it was something I haven't ever felt before and especially when you start to fly on your own uh, like the power is is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> power yeah I, yeah it is it is power isn't it? It's, yeah it's <laughs> It's a real like so, sense of freedom, that first solo flight you do, you kind of take off oh, and yeah. you look beside you and nobody's sitting there and you're just like, okay, I'm in the air by myself. <laughs> How did you choose your training school? So I sort of had it in my head that I was in a quite a comfortable position in my cabin crew role. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was a hard worker. I could probably at least try to get on some sort of a sponsored program. 
um airline sponsored programs aren't that easy to come by but once you've done one of the interviews one of the assessment days you get a grasp of what the next one's going to be like so I knew that I'd had a like at least a small chance of getting one so I chose my flight school through the sponsor program I ended up getting on which was with Flybe. And what does a sponsor program mean? In the olden days, sorry, if it's more your time then. <laughs> it, it used oh. to mean that you'd get actual financial sponsorship. So some courses were fully sponsored, um, some might be part sponsored. Uh, my sponsorship just meant that once I'd finished the training required, I should get the job with the airline that sponsored me. And that didn't go according to plan. Yeah, rest in peace to fly B. <laughs> No, it, I mean, I was still very lucky because that sponsor program, although it didn't end up how I wanted it to, it got me to be at the school, which I really enjoyed on a course, which is hopefully going to get me onto the jets in the near future. So all is in there all. any um, potential with Flybe, you know, it's possibly getting resurrected. Is there any potential of yeah. you getting back picked up by them or is that a complete write off now? Do you know? We've had the chat with the head of training and someone in terms, I think they were like, I actually can't remember who it was, someone in Flybe or the old Flybe that had sort of a pick of pilots mm -hmm. at the time. And um, they said they have like a list of our names, so it's potential that we could get picked up by them. But where we find ourselves now, there were six of us that this affected. We were on an MPL originally. Um, so the MPL meant that we were obviously tied to Flybe to finish or to get the ATPL after 1500 hours. Um, once Flybe went under, the school supported us transferring to an ATPL. So we've got, I don't know, like six to 10 courses who were already pilots at Flybe who are still on the MPL because they haven't achieved their 1500 hours. So obviously, in my head, at least, they're going to get the call up before someone mm. like us. Do you want to just describe to Dave, because Dave has zero knowledge of flying, what an MPL is versus an ATPL? Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so the MPL, um, in the nutshell, is very much like airline orientated. So an airline chooses you to go onto an MPL and you have to finish that MPL license with the airline. So my MPL uh, in my flight school was not very many flying hours in terms of single engine planes, a couple on the, the twin engine planes, but most of your hours are done in a 737 simulator. So they're gearing you up to get straight on the line, straight away flying those, those planes for the airline. Um, your MPL becomes an ATPL after 1500 hours of an airline. Whereas now I have a frozen ATPL, which means I can take my license to any airline I want to go to. I can fly with them. And once I get my 1500 hours, as I would with the MPL, my ATPL becomes unfrozen. If that makes any sense at all. <laughs> the one chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. And... <laughs> uh, so how many hours are you on? Am I on now? Yeah. Oh God, I don't know. Like, I've got enough for my frozen ATPL. I don't even okay. know how many that is. Okay. I think I've got 150 actual flying hours, and my sim hours take it over. I think it's 210. Dave, we're going into civil aviation licensing requirements now. That is a wormhole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know, it's we are very much making ourselves a niche podcast if we go uh, <laughs> if we go into that. Um, how to talk to me about? simulators then because in in previous episodes we've we've sort of brushed on them and the fact that simulators themselves have instructors how close are they to the real thing obviously the jeopardy is is a great deal lower but do you get a good feel for flying from the simulator experience i mean in terms of the jet so I can't really comment because I've never flown one. <laughs> um, but it does feel very real. And all the scenarios you're, you're faced with, although you wouldn't expect to have a decompression, pilot incapacitation, you know, one engine out landing. Once you start sort of getting those done, it does feel like your, your stress levels are rising when you know you're getting uh, certain emergencies like you probably would experience in a, in a real plane. Um, but if we go back to like the smaller sims, uh, the, they don't even move. You just sit in a seat, look at some screens. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's the Isle of Wight, you know. 
<laughs> All of those things sound absolutely terrifying, by the way. No, you're, you're trained. Ben knows all about so it. So Dave, the, the smaller yeah. sims, when you're like doing your initial training, they're designed for more sort of quite basic procedural um, aspects. So literally like following a line towards a radio beacon and stuff like that. Whereas once you get in the simulator, that is a realistic, it's like a, a really immersive computer game. Um, yeah. Because actually, when you're dealing with a lot of emergencies, you don't you don't look outside that much. Now the graphics in these simulators are very very good, um, but you're not staring out the window. A lot of the stuff you're doing is internal to the cockpit, and that cockpit is a mm -hmm. carbon copy of what you would have in real life. Okay, so so very important then. But well, quite simply, because you're not gonna you're not gonna send a. I don't know, 777 up that costs however many hundreds of millions of dollars and say, oh, by the way, we're going to turn this engine off now to give this uh, to give this young pilot the experience of landing it. That does sound like a very expensive way of doing things. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> oh, good. So what about um, what about the transition between cabin crew and and pilot then? I know uh, you've you've still got a little way to go before you get that that dream job that I hope is just around the corner for you. Do you think you're going to come up against any obstacles, kind of people's attitudes towards you? Yeah, I do think it's, it, it could be a bit of a stigma and I have experienced it um, at pre previous interviews as well. Hmm. Um, you sort of turn up and that they, like being cabin crew has been so beneficial to me. I literally loved it. It was a fantastic job and it was perfect to be my stepping stone. But sometimes it's hard for people to see past the fact that you were cabin crew. Um, mm. Saying that, I received the same training that everyone else has. Like, we're all on a completely equal playing field now. So it's up to me how I portray myself in future interviews, I suppose. And if I can do that, then I should be able to do anything. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, of comparable things. Obviously, there's such there's so few industries that are that are comparable with aviation. But I remember being a teenager and working on a building site, and then I don't know, like the buildings inspector would uh, would turn up, and they'd always have a suit on with their high vis over their suit and a brand new car, and all the lads on the the site would be like, "Oh, look at him! He's never done a hard day's work in his life." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I was just wondering, what's the relationship like? between cabin crew and pilots. Essentially, what do cabin crew think of pilots? That's what I want to know. Ben, block your ears. No, well, I was always a bit of a, like, I was called a flight deck floozy, which is not <laughs> true. Okay? It was only because I needed it as a learning curve. So I would always be the one to sort of like volunteer to do the walk around. So before flight, the pilot like walks around. So I'd go and do that with the first officer or the captain. Um, I'd try and get into the flight deck for as many like takeoffs and landings as I could. So I always tried to have a good relationship with um, the pilots because it was something that I needed to have. But there definitely is like a cabin crew pilot stigma, um, I think. And especially if you're going towards some of the more archaic <laughs> um, airlines and archaic uh, pilots, there's sometimes a bit of lost in translation chat that goes on. We have crew buses. So we take the crew bus from the terminal to the plane or from the airport to where we're staying um, when we're in a different city. And you can definitely tell that the pilots will sit at the very front, you know, headphones on, on the iPads and the crew are organising drinks at 6pm at the back. <laughs> um, and do you think uh, with with regards to flight deck floozy, and obviously you were you were incredibly keen to, to learn, uh, do you think those intentions may have been misinterpreted? Hence no, the nickname. Never. I okay. mean, maybe amongst the crew, uh, <laughs> but everything I did in the flight deck was like only of a professional. I literally learned so much from even spending 10 minutes taking a cup of tea in the middle of the night for example mm. so it was it was definitely a tool that I used to help me get where I am now and Ben what do pilots think of cabin crew um I think oh do you know what pilots is probably a yeah I was gonna say I think I mean... touching it there that it really depends on the mindset of the of the pilots the whole feeling for the flight starts within the first like 10 seconds 
when the captain kind of says hello to the crew, you can really get the sense of, right, this is going to be a good flight or a bad flight. Um, and if that rapport is not there straight away, hardly anyone will come and visit you. You can have like a 12 hour flight <laughs> and because cabin crew in most airlines have to check up on the pilots every half an hour just to make sure there's no medical issues and they're awake and you know everything's fine. Um, but they can do that by physically coming into the cockpit or by giving you a call on, on the, the land line. line. And, and if there's yeah, a okay. bad start to the flight, that's all you get. It's a, everything all right? Yeah, cheers, bye. Done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty of that. <laughs> Are you really? So it is a nightmare when you've, when you've got a captain who gives it like a really bad first impression. You're just like, oh, this. It kind of taints you with the same brush because nobody wants to come and visit. And mm. everyone kind of thinks that if they speak to you, then they're going to have to speak to the captain. So not going to risk it. Mm -hmm. But is that something, Ben, that as you develop to become a, a captain is that something that you're going to be very yeah, aware absolutely. of and i think honestly it's got a lot lot better it tends to be just the real tail end of the the old cohort where it's kind of the captain is the boss and nobody can say anything against them i mean 99 percent of pilots now are very good in my opinion um yeah but the cabin crew thing's funny because I spoke to um, a cabin crew member who's been flying for like 35 years, never visited the cockpit. That's a long time. In her entire what? life, she just was not interested. She's more than happy sitting down the back, having a chat. And I, I just could not fathom that, Incredible. but each to their own, right? Well, I think that just shows the different reasons that people get into the job, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Like you, you must have met some incredible characters as a as a member of cabin crew. I think crew themselves, they say it takes a certain type of person to be cabin crew, um, and that you do meet some of the best people and some of the worst people. <laughs> so it, it is very much you can miss. You get a couple that will refuse to conform. You get a couple that want to talk all night. Get a couple that fall asleep all the time. Like. <laughs> It is definitely a character, a character game in Cabin Crew. You need a work ethic though, don't you? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You need the work ethic and the body clock for it. <laughs> Those are the two major things. I just, I, I, on, yeah, just, and just the, the amount of time you spend on your feet. Mm -hmm. I think my, I think my absolute most I ever did was, I think I did 2,400, 2,400, 24,000, sorry. 24, no way. Yeah, in one flight. I think it was a Bangkok or something where you're constantly giving out beer, <laughs> but, yeah, I, but it was I, a lot. I think that's about 12K. Up and down, constantly. Probably a bit Don't more stop. Than that, that's astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so well, that's the thing. I mean, now you're a pilot, you're just going to be sat on your ass the whole time. No, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Susie. Yes. What's the dream? Uh, 787 long haul from London. Okay. Yeah. I think always... um, people say you're either an Airbus or a Boeing person. And there's a lot of uh, rivalry between the two. I mean, we've got our very own Airbus man there as well. <laughs> um, but I feel I'm going to be a Boeing girl. Why Boeing? Well, this is where the the Airbus people try and stay up, sell the fact that they get a drop down table. But realistically, <laughs> it's not all about furniture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think... Um, I, I really like the feel of the Boeing. Um, I've been mostly on Boeing. The only Airbuses I've ever really done are the, the smaller ones, as in flown as crew. Um, and I want to fly the big jets. And I think the, the 787 has a really nice feel to it. Ben, why Airbus? It's the future, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's the future. It looks oh. after you and it's nice and comfortable. And we do have a table for our dinner. We're not heathens. We don't eat dinner on our laps.
<laughs> so basically, lived. right, the difference is that they're both essentially the same. Boeing has got like a control yoke, right? So it's got like a steering wheel. And it's considered a bit more of a, a pilot's plane because you can, it's, it's like a bit more conventional. So you can feel the flying. Whereas an Airbus has a little joystick, we call it a side stick. Uh, it's got no mechanical connections whatsoever. It's just a computer signal sent backwards. And it's got some like artificial feedback. So you can kind of feel a bit of pressure, uh, but it's all, it's a lot more about um, just knowing what you're doing rather than feeling the flight. So Ben's over there playing Mario Kart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> oh, Boeing the Airbus banter is going to be <laughs> perhaps my favourite feature of this podcast series. I think it might oh, be quite a consistent feeling as well. Um, <laughs> So think things aren't as you as anyone wants them to be in the aviation industry in the moment, whether it's pilots, whether it's cabin crew, whether it's people like me who are just frequent travelers who are who are desperate to to, to get back to work in, in other countries. Uh, how patient are you willing to be, Susie, with regards to to getting in the cockpit and, and actually becoming the pilot that you want to be? Well, Personally, I am impatient, very impatient. I mean, I've worked what I feel has been four years to get to this point now. Um, and where I did originally have that job offer when I started my training, it's all been a bit of an anticlimax finishing and not sure where to, to go from here. So I'm giving myself a, a year to two years. Okay. Um, Pilot school is an absolute slog, the best 20 months, but it is so difficult, so difficult. Mm. So really having this time for respite now is actually quite important, I think. Um, and yeah, we'll start the job hunt probably uh, towards the end of 2021. Do you plan on doing um, any sort of uh, light aircraft flying or anything to keep your hand in, or are you just gonna put it on pause for the time being? I mean, I'm down on the South Coast, so I'm quite close to certain airports. There's a couple of small flight schools there. I'll pop over to Bournemouth Way. Like, there's definitely options around. Um, and I got a single engine rating as well um, when I was doing my um, my program of flight school. So I do have the ability to go and fly the smaller planes if I want to. I definitely will try and do it at least an hour a month. <laughs> I think that is so expensive. Like, I think that'll be all I can really do for now. And I've considered getting the flight instructor certification as well. So a couple of options. Staying busy. Just yeah. going back to um, having that supposed guaranteed job and then it being taken away. Um, what kind of psychological impact did that have? Do you I think, think more than anything, it was just a really stressful situation. I held out longer than I hoped to get that first like flying school role. Um, because it was for a sponsor program with with the sort of guarantee of that job at the end. So it was extremely disheartening. But realistically, I've now come out with a license that's a lot more applicable for, for the sort of industry now. Um, and I've come out with um, a commercial pilot's license, an instrument rating and a single and multi-engine rating, none of which I would have come out if I'd done the other license. So... I'm definitely better placed than I would have been, but I don't have the job. <laughs> Plenty of time for that. Yeah. Plenty of time. It, it's really interesting hearing you talk about things like that because it's just not something I'd consider. The fact that you are both qualified pilots is is just so far beyond anything that that my that my tiny little brain could could even comprehend but then when you break it down you make it sound so functional it's like right i've got this license and this rating and i've got these stamps on my card and and stuff like that there are there are so many of these boxes that need to be ticked so many of these tests that that need to be passed i mean it is an incredibly cool job but there are a lot of well, boxes that you need to tick. It is it is quite functional in terms of its format, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think obviously aviation, the first rule is safety. So mm. having to go through all of these tests, although it's stressful and it's, it was super testing, it's all for the, the main reason. So you're happy to do so really. And it's just okay. constant as well. I mean, with most jobs, you kind of do the training at the beginning and then you like do the role that you've been trained for. Whereas 
obviously you do that in piloting, but I mean, the absolute minimum you have to do as an airline pilot is a test every six months. And that's two days of four hour blocks in the sim with engines blowing up and decompressions and gas masks on and all sorts of stuff. Um, and that's about the easiest you're going to get it. How is this? It's constant it's training. With regards to your path, Susie, um, if you could rewind however many number of years to when you finished university, would you take the same path to becoming a qualified pilot now? I think if I'd have had a bigger interest in aviation before, that if I'd seen it as an actual feasible um, career path like, rather than the leisure centre manager, um, <laughs> I probably would have tried to have gotten into, say, the air squadron at university. Um, I definitely attended air shows before. Um, I've been around airfields um, and I've been to a lot of flight school at open days. Um, but if I'd have done all that, let's say, the two years earlier, um, without my cabin crew stint, I wouldn't have the knowledge that I do from being the other side of the door. Um, but I would probably potentially be sort of a couple of hundred hours down now in a job. Um, so timing hasn't been my friend, but I do think that the path I did take was the best for me at the time. And um, would you would you recommend cabin crew as a job for anybody? Yeah. Definitely. I recommend it all the time. There's right. so many people that are sort of stuck in retail, um, you know, stuck in the in the day job that isn't quite giving them what they want. And the main role of cabin crew, apart from safety, is having the confidence to be in front of people. You have to have that outgoing nature uh, and you have to be able to deal with a lot of issues you don't want to deal with. Um, but you do that in retail, things like that anyway. Um, and if you want to do all that alongside traveling the world for free, um, I don't understand why people don't go for it more often. Yeah. Is it competitive though? I can't imagine it's that easy to just get a cabin crew job. I think there's a couple of like, uh, difficulties, uh, to get into the role. You have to be a certain height for starters and it's the same for pilot. You have to be between two height ranges um there's a different set for boys and girls as well which is always a bit odd That's um weird. yeah so a lot of people i've heard uh who want to be cabin crew have failed the first hurdle because they've lied about their height <laughs> wow um, yeah they, they test your reach um which is basically so if you were to be holding on to one of the handles of the doors and you had to pull the um the manual inflation handle of a slide you have to be able to reach it okay so that's tested. Um, the, but... the, the different heights for men and women, that, that winds me up. You, to be fair, Ben, you must be right on the cusp because you're massive. Uh, yeah, I think nobody's just checked, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but the different heights for men and women, I mean, we're, we're at risk of travelling down a massive wormhole here, but I don't know if either of you have read Invisible Women, but the fact that when they test airbags with crash test dummies they do it based on the average weight of a man not a woman so if you're in a car crash then a woman is more likely to die than a man that's really good news thank you well you know <laughs> it's a it's a tuesday morning i just thought i'd send you into the week with a smile on your face but yeah it is I, i'm sure there is i'm sure there are decisions made by people far above my pay grade uh, that have that have decided the the reasons behind that but it does seem a strange one so but you were uh, you were all right you were tall enough or short enough okay. I, I vaguely remember years ago reading that um there there was a, a, a brief but ill-fated air whales that flew out of Cardiff Wales Airport. And don't ask me to tell you what planes they were, but they were very small and quite rickety old boats. And the cabin crew had to be smaller than normal cabin crew because otherwise they'd have just been dragging their heads against the ceiling the entire time. So they just I think they just went searching the hills and the valleys for the for the shortest women they could find and offered them. I wonder where air whales even flew to. I've never heard of it. it well, it was it was early 2000s. It was, and, I, and I'd, I'd only heard of it because um, I was a big rugby supporter and they sponsored the Ospreys. Yeah. Cardiff to Hollyhead. But yeah. Lovely. Cardiff, oh, the big one. <laughs> Over the water. Absolutely. <laughs> Over the water. To, to your right, you've got Offers Dyke. 
<laughs> do, do you, um, Ben, do you, uh, when you're giving the sort of route plan out to the route plan, what am I, the AA website, <laughs> when you're... <laughs> <laughs> when you're when you're telling the the, the passengers where we're going to go and it's like oh so we'll be we'll be coming over the channel and we'll be going over swindon and following the m4 corridor up do you give those kinds of instructions do i give them y yeah well so I, I i quite like it i quite like it when the pilot does that when they essentially tell you the really depends how much in. time you've got at the beginning of the flight uh, and how lazy okay. you're being so we, we've got a couple of, uh, like a few elements that we have to include in a PA, which are mainly safety based. Um, and then anything else is kind of at your discretion. So if you're, if you're in a bit of a rush and, you know, things are going a little bit wrong, then probably just scrap it. But why do you tell us the cruising speed and the altitude? Because we think people are interested in it. Okay. So it, it is quite, because I mean, I generally am, but it, that is, it's literally because of passengers. Yeah, there's a lot of people that, that really are interested. I mean, we have sort of yeah. plane spotters and uh, just enthusiasts coming to the cockpit after the flight. And a lot of them... Nerds! <laughs> <laughs> I've, had, I've had people come in and they've got little logbooks of every flight they've ever taken. And they want to know the routes. They want to know the cruising speed. They want to know the altitude. They want to know your tail number, everything. I love it. I absolutely love it. You probably don't. But... Well, it... Do you ever <laughs> let them wear your hat? Well, it makes me feel a bit bad because they're more interested in it than I am. That's a great question, actually, Susie. I don't know if you heard that, Ben. Would you ever let them wear your hat? Yeah, so I've let a lot of kids wear my hat. Oh. Uh, what's the cutoff? Like 14? <laughs> we I'll probably push it to sort of 15. But above that, it just starts getting a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got your hat, Susie? I don't have a hat. I used to have my cabin crew hat, but I sat on it so much. <laughs> that it didn't <laughs> yeah, and I used to use, we had a hat box as well, and I used to use that to, like, transport either Easter eggs or bananas, <laughs> and it also fit in a Cheesecake Factory cheesecake box for the so... Uh, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Susie, I suppose a final question is, um, have you got any advice for people who are who are thinking about becoming a pilot? I think it's it's incredible that, that both you and Ben have mentioned that you're not from aviation families. So this is something that you've done off your own bat. You have found your own route in. And I really, really hope that in the not too distant future, everything comes to fruition. And, and you get the job that you want and, and the job that you deserve. But have you got any advice for those people who, well, I suppose want to be a pilot, but have those doubts? It just seems like something that's so far away from them. Yeah, it definitely at the moment, especially is like very much a distant thought for a lot of people. Um, but I would just say the most exposure you can get, like the better. So make sure you do go to those open days at all the schools that you want to consider. Make sure you're going to sort of flight demonstrations um, when maybe even take a sort of a, a practice flight with an instructor. You can get them really cheap experience days wise. Um, so, yeah, just try and be as exposed to aviation as you can. Maybe even get a job in aviation, even if it's washing a plane. Um, having all of these tiny parts of like showing interest come across really well in an interview. Um, and then apart from that, it would just be make sure that your choice is financially protected, uh, especially at the moment. It's not the best time, perhaps, or argued by some anyway, to enter into some sort of flight training. So having your back covered is really important at the moment. But I hope it's going to be a good career. I mean, Ben's definitely having a lovely time. <laughs> so it, it'll be positive in the end, I'm sure. Ben, when was the last time you washed a plane? Well, I, well I, I didn't hear you, mate, but I think your silence is definitely... <laughs> 2009, it was. Oh, 2009, goodness me, over a decade ago. Yeah. See, that's it. it once, you, once you put the legwork in, Susie, it's easy street. Just sit there and get served, and all you've got to do is take off and land. <laughs> I mean, it's a job, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you're sacked. Uh, well, good luck. <laughs> Um, good luck, Susie, and thank you so much for your time. This has been a lovely, lovely conversation. Um, will you make me a promise, please? 
Mm. When you do get the pilot's job and when it does uh, start to turn out really well for you, you'll come back on the podcast and tell us about it. Oh, I'd love to. I've had a lovely time. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Susie. Look after yourself and we'll speak to you soon, okay? Thanks, Bye-bye. Susie. Thanks for listening to the Pilot Base podcast. We'll be back next week with another great guest from the aviation industry. Don't forget to check out our new career platform at pilotbase.com and all the socials at Pilot Base HQ. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe and write us a review.